Well, good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, welcome to the US-India Strategic Partnership Forum and Square Patent Box virtual discussion on the US, I would say, not just post-election briefing, but the current scenario itself. Uh, we do have a lineup of very strong speakers. Uh, we have Ambassador Frank Wisner. Uh, we have former US House Speaker John Berner. I have Congressman Joe Crowley. I have Frank Somolis, co-chair, International Trade Practice at Square Patent Box. And Alisa Ayers, Senior Fellow for India, Pakistan, and South Asia Council on Foreign Relations itself. Uh, we do have an audience which is made of US Indian CEOs and then large think tank community, both from India and, and, and the US itself, and, and leadership from private and uh, public uh, uh, institution itself. And we do also have press in the briefing. So this is a on the record conversation. I am going to first invite uh, uh, you, uh, former US, uh, speaker, John Boner, uh, Boehner, and, and Congressman Joe Crowley to give the opening remarks. And if you know, uh, uh, Mr. Boehner was the 53rd speaker of the US House of Representatives and he joined Squire Patent Box public policy team during the autumn of 2016. Speaker Boehner serves as a strategic advisor to Squire Patent Box clients in the US and abroad and focuses on global business development. And, and Congressman Joe Crowley is a senior policy advisor providing strategic advice and consulting to client on a wide range of public policy matter, including tax and financial services healthcare. And as a former chair of the Democratic Caucus, the fourth highest ranking position among House Democrats. So over to you, uh, Speaker Boehner, and then to Congressman Crowley. You're on mute. John, you're on mute. Uh, let me start by saying thanks to our friends at the U.S.-India Strategic Partnership Forum uh, for hosting this event and inviting us to be a part of it. I think the, the relationship between the United States and India uh, is an increasingly critical one. Uh, and that's something that both Joe and I recognized during our time in the leadership of the United States Congress. I had the privilege of hosting Prime Minister Modi uh, at the United States Capitol in September of 2014 uh, during his first state visit. Uh, Joe was part of that as well. And in the six years that have passed since then, uh, the strategic and economic uh, significance of the U.S.-India relationship has only grown. Now, with respect to the election, uh, the American people have spoken. And uh, it's not clear, entirely clear yet uh, what they've said, but let's start with what we know. Uh, one, uh, there was no blue wave. Uh, Republicans uh, appeared to be in a position to retain uh, control of the United States Senate. Uh, that it's pretty clear they're going to pick up uh, five to 10 seats uh, in the U.S. House. And uh, as Joe and I know, a lot of people walk in the election booth and uh, vote for president and walk out. Uh, you know, in a typical election, not in a presidential year, about 10% of the people who voted uh, for president, of the 100% that voted for president, only about 90% would actually vote uh, in the congressional race. And so, uh, uh, we're going to have a stronger Republican position in the Congress uh, by holding uh, the Senate and uh, a much narrower majority for uh, Speaker Pelosi uh, in the next Congress. Uh, secondly, uh, I would point out uh, polls are worthless. All right? uh, for the second presidential election in a row, uh, most of these pollsters or websites, uh, they just totally blew it. And uh, you know, I thought after the 2016 election, they get their act together and figure out uh, what they're missing. Uh, but uh, polls don't capture intensity. Uh, they don't capture uh, uh, the, the, the mood of the people. And they surely don't capture uh, who's really likely to show up. And so uh, uh, they've got a lot of work uh, to do on the polling side. Now, uh, the third point I make is this. Uh, we could be in for a, a long ride that makes uh, the Florida recount 20 years ago look like a walk in the park. Or frankly, it could be over today. 
Uh, nobody really knows. If I, you know, I had a guess, it looks like it's Joe Biden's uh, to lose uh, between uh, Arizona, uh, Nevada, and, uh, and we'll see what happens in, uh, in Pennsylvania. Uh, it, it looks like uh, it's Joe's uh, to lose. And so, uh, but it, it could, you could already imagine uh, the lawsuits that have been filed, the lawsuits that will be filed. Uh, but if, if Joe uh, Biden today were to lock down Arizona, Nevada, and and uh, Pennsylvania, you know, the, the race is all but over. And so uh, while it uh, uh, this looks like uh, we could be in for more gridlock, uh, I would make uh, this point. Uh, Joe Biden and uh, Mitch McConnell have a long, long relationship, some 40 years. Uh, during the time I was uh, Speaker of the House, Mitch McConnell was uh, president of the Senate. And even uh, before that, when Harry Reid was president of the Senate, uh, Harry, I mean, uh, Joe Biden, uh, many times uh, knew how to sit down with the Congress and cut deals, uh, something uh, President Obama wasn't very good at. And, uh, and I can just tell you that uh, the relationship and the trust uh, between Biden and McConnell uh, is very strong. And so uh, th there could be an opportunity here uh, for, to, for Joe and, uh, and Mitch uh, to kind of work through some things and actually get some things done. And so uh, those are my thoughts at the, the moment. I'll turn it over to Joe. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And um, let me uh, first and foremost say, uh, uh, putting aside the, the debate on, on polling for just a moment, I think it is interesting that Democrats did uh, retain control of the House of Representatives Albeit it was done in a more uh, unique, unique way. Um, it was not the way in which they envisioned. Um, and I think uh, as we see the results coming in from Pennsylvania, we expect more about this afternoon. Uh, some of those seats that well, Democrats thought they lost, in fact, they will have won. And as we wait in some of the uh, states, because each state uh, as election law is different, um, well, we're gonna see that Democrats are gonna pick up in absentee and in mail-in ballots. But having said that, I think the speaker is right um, that you know this notion or idea there would be a, a total blue wave and that we'd win the Senate. I, I was always a bit more reserved about that in the sense I thought we would come closer in the Senate but not actually take the Senate. Um, and um, I do think that Joe Biden will be elected. I think we will expect even while we may be on this on the Zoom that um, more reporting coming in from Pennsylvania, uh, reportedly from. Uh, uh, Philadelphia, uh, for the most part, is going to be overwhelmingly in favor of Joe Biden. Uh, and I think it's important to note the historic nature of this election. And just, just two points um, uh, I want to point out. Um, this was an incredible turnout here in the United States. Uh, one, one of, if not the greatest turnout in the history of our country. And the idea or notion of turning out an incumbent president um, although it's happened, uh, it, it's not typical. It really is not typical. We haven't had this happen since George H.W. Bush. Um, and uh, before that, it really didn't happen often. You have to go back to really in terms of his, historic precedent. Uh, this is more like the 1932 Hoover defeat uh, by Roosevelt uh, in terms of the, the turnout and, uh, and the vote here. Uh, so that's something important to keep in mind. The other is that what's been what's really been overshadowed here, and I think would have some interest here to um, the um, the Indian uh, audience, um, both in India here and in the states, is not only do we have the first woman who will serve in the executive as vice president uh, in Kamala Harris, but the first woman of Indian descent as well, and I know that that has ha that has to cause great ethnic pride uh, to the. Indian American community, but I think the Indian community writ large and what it says to the rest of the world as well, I think is important. Uh, I think uh, John, uh, Speaker Boehner is right uh, that there is a relationship between Mitch McConnell and Joe Biden. Joe was a man of the Senate. Uh, and now I think he's on the precipice of being the president. Uh, I think that um, uh, there'll be more opportunities to, to make deals. I, I've also been saying on many of these Zooms that the focus on taxes, I think, uh, during uh, the crisis we're undergoing right now uh, was not uh, not real. Um, I don't think there's uh, 
any appetite right now to disturb the uh, uh, the economy any more than has to be. Uh, the notion right now is to crush this virus, I think to put Americans back to work, get an infrastructure package bill done. I think Biden will have Republicans in his cabinet. Uh, I think that is critical as well. I think as he has said, politically and publicly, he wants to be not a democratic president, but a president for all Americans. I believe he really believes that. Um, and one other thing I think is important, I think Democrats were hurt in the House in particular. Uh, we saw some incumbent Democrats lose, the others won, and there was also, but uh, a net loss in the House for Democrats was unexpected and getting back to the polls. And I think that, that that's because here locally, they were tagged uh, with the socialist tag. Uh, and for those who are familiar with my own situation, I lost to AOC two years ago. And um, I think we're seeing a broadening of the, of, of the impact of not only my election, uh, but others. And what I've been saying is that you can replace all the Joe Crowleys or uh, inner city uh, people like me uh, that you want with other Democrats. And it doesn't move the needle in terms of who controls the House representatives. The House representatives is controlled not by inner city Democrats uh, in terms of electing. They may control the body, but not by uh, putting us in the majority. That's done in the suburban and even more, ur uh, more rural areas uh, where we're competitive with Republicans and districts that are more competitive. And that is something that hasn't changed. I think they were also tagged with defund, defunding the police departments and law and order. So even though uh, some Democrats uh, were reelected in the House narrowly, uh, they were stung, I think, by uh, that, that political rhetoric. And I think Democrats need to find a way to speak to rural and suburban uh, voters uh, in a more concrete way, less condescending way, a more understanding way as well. I think we can be for social justice and change, but also be for law and order. We have to find a way to speak to people, uh, both Democrats, Republicans, and in particular, independents uh, from a House representative's point of view. And one last thing on the Senate, uh, some gains are made for Democrats, but not nearly enough to take back the Senate. And I think, and John would probably agree, I think the American people are comfortable with a divided government. Um, to a fairly well and uh, a tempered government. But I think um, more than anything else, they want to crush this virus. Uh, and one last point, I do think, regardless of who the president is, I think, I, I do believe the future is bright in terms of the relationship between the U.S. and India. I think brighter now under, uh, under a, a Biden-Harris uh, uh, regime. Um, but I, I, I believe very strongly, as the speaker does, in this relationship with this 21st century. Thank you. Uh Congressman, uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me uh, uh, invite uh, Frank uh, Samolis, who's a co-chair of Squire Patent Box International Trade Practice, and he chairs the India Practice Group uh, for Squire Patent Box. Frank. Thank you, Mikesh, and thank you for having me. I'm honored to be uh, participating with such a distinguished group of uh, panelists. Um, I agree with what the speaker and Joe Crowley said in terms of the importance of the bilateral relationship. And that will translate into an ongoing trade policy of engagement, not confrontation, certainly much different than the US-China relationship. There is no animus uh, by the United States toward India. And in fact, uh, as many of you know, we're on the cusp of concluding an agreement, not a free trade agreement, but a package of trade measures with India, it remains to be seen whether or not the Trump administration, if it's going out of office, would conclude that agreement uh, before January. Um, there is some time to do that, but there are other big issues on the trade front, such as the US-UK talks, US talks with Kenya, uh, the French digital tax, WTO, Boeing, Airbus disputes. There's a long list. Um, I don't think, if it's not concluded, I don't think it would be from disinterest in engaging with India. And indeed, I think if there is a Biden administration, there will continue to be engagement with India on, on trade issues. Uh, let me also stress the importance of the US-India relationship in the context of the WTO. Uh, the Trump administration did not have a very sympathetic view of the World Trade Organization and in fact has stymied uh, the institutional process by holding up the appointment of 
appellate body judges. Uh, if Biden comes in, he'll be coming in at a time when the WTO is going through a structural leadership change. We are now down to two candidates, two women, uh, the former Nigerian minister of finance and the Korean trade negotiator. Uh, regardless of which one of those two prevails, I believe there will be a resurgence in interest in getting the WTO to be more active in conducting truly multilateral trade negotiations. And on that front, I think the US and India have a common interest in making sure that there can be a more cohesive alliance, uh, not on a regional or bilateral basis, but on a multilateral basis. So I think the confluence of a Biden administration with a new WTO director general augurs well for both US and India. Um, on the, on the broader US-India bilateral relationship, there will obviously always be impediments. We're looking at a digital tax issue, we're looking at trade and services, the GSP issue, a number of things that uh, may or may not be resolved to India's satisfaction. But the important point is, um, in the broader view of US trade policy, India will remain a steadfast ally and not a competitor, particularly as tensions with China continue. And I think even with the President Biden, there will not be a let up in being quote unquote tough on China. I think that will continue, certainly in a more nuanced fashion, a more structured fashion, but that will inure to the benefit of India and its relationship with the United States. I suspect uh, a President Biden would be more engaged in multilateral engagement, not only in the WTO, but in things like the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So the whole view of uh, what a President Biden would do, I think would be focused more on reassuring our allies so that we have common interests. And if there's any way to address a competitive threat uh, by China, it's through collective action. And that collective action can be through the WTO, it can be through the TPP, or it can be in an enhanced bilateral relationship through some sort of trade agreement. We're nowhere close, as I said, to a free trade agreement, but I think as Congressman Crowley said with Kamala Harris and with an increased visibility on the role of Indian Americans in the US political system, that will only support and enhance a bilateral relationship, not only on the international basis, but from a domestic political basis that will work to a President Biden's favor. Thank you, Mukesh. Thank, thank you, uh, uh, Frank. Uh, I am going to uh, invite uh, Alyssa, who heads the uh, India, Pakistan, and South Asia at CFR, but more important in her book, Our Time Has Come, how India is making its place in the world uh, is, is a phenomenal book. If you're not read it, go buy it and read it. So Alyssa, over to you. Thank you so much, Mukesh, for that introduction and for the plug on my book, uh, Music to an Author's Ears. Thank you for that. Um, and thanks so much for today's invitation to join uh, this wonderful panel to talk about the uh, impact of our election and what that suggests for US-India relations. Um, Ambassador Wisner has asked me to speak specifically uh, about geopolitical and regional relationships. So I'll try to cover that ground, which we haven't gotten to uh, with the other speakers. And here I just would like to note, uh, as I've noted in other contexts, that you know the Trump administration has really built on the work of the Obama administration, which in turn built on the work of the George W. Bush administration before it, and the Clinton administration before that in furthering defense and strategic ties with India. And I think you can fairly say that what underlies this development is a real growing convergence of interests in the changing geopolitics of this larger Indo-Pacific region. Um, it's been true, I think, since around the early 2000s that Washington and New Delhi uh, began to see overlapping views about the changing geopolitics in Asia and uh, had a, a kind of realization that there was a desire to see a balance of power in the region. Ambassador Wisner has seen this so clearly for decades. 
Um, but really importantly, I think you've seen China's changed behavior over the last, let's say, seven years or so has helped solidify where Washington and New Delhi meet on the security issues. So that's why you've seen the reemergence uh, and the, the possibility of the reemergence of the quadrilateral consultations. It has now become more institutionalized meeting regularly at the assistant secretary level, now at the ministerial level, uh, a naval exercise component as well is taking place as we meet today uh, in the Indian Ocean. Uh, this was a more delicate uh, issue diplomatically a decade back and those hesitations have gone away. I also believe that the changed nature of China's approach to the region and the way China sees uh, what it desires for itself in the Indo-Pacific region, that change is fully appreciated by Democrats. Um, very specifically, you can see how Vice President Biden has framed this issue. He published an op-ed in late October in India West. I encourage you all to read it because it lays out where he stands on a lot of these issues. But he said, the US and India will stand together against terrorism in all its forms and work together to promote a region of peace and stability where neither China nor any other country threatens its neighbors. He also said we'll open markets and grow the middle class in both the United States and India and confront other international challenges together like climate change, global health, transnational terrorism and nuclear proliferation. I think that gives us a lot to work with when we think about what a change in government in the United States would suggest for the US-India relationship. To me, it suggests continuity on the strategic and defense side with India, certainly. Vice President Biden has a longstanding and repeated commitment to a strong relationship with India. And you can see that going back in all of his speeches and writings over the years. Now, I will say that I have been a little concerned that the heavy emphasis on strategic and defense ties in the Trump administration has kind of left some other areas of cooperation languishing. There hasn't been, from what I've seen, any major push on the global governance issues like UN Security Council reform or uh, membership for India in APEC, the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Forum. Those are just two examples. Could be because the Trump administration, as we all know, has had a more go it alone approach rather than a reform from the inside approach to these institutions. Uh, it has been the case for years, obviously, as many people on today's uh, Zoom know that India seeks a place in global institutions commensurate with its scale and its accomplishments. President Obama was the first US president to commit to supporting Indian membership in a reformed and expanded UN Security Council. He made that commitment when he traveled to India in the fall of 2010. Um, we've also seen that Tony Blinken, uh, Vice President Biden's top foreign policy advisor, his former national security advisor, reiterated this past August that if elected, uh, Vice President Biden would help India gain that seat on a reformed Security Council. Now, I, I want to be sure to mention uh, an important way uh, a Biden-Harris administration would differ from the Trump administration and its approach to India. And that's the area of climate change and clean energy cooperation. This was an enormous focus for the Obama-Biden administration with India. I served in that administration, spent a lot of time on these issues, uh, but it was a huge component of our bilateral relationship, not only in the effort to reach agreement uh, in the Paris Agreement, uh, but as well in furthering cooperation on clean energy you know, a signature Obama-Biden policy was the Joint Clean Energy Research and Development Program. Uh, that worked with the private sector to uh, devise consortia on kind of next generation technologies and research in this space. Uh, clean energy finance, climate resilience, and promoting energy efficiency were all high priorities and uh, cooperation extended across the development agencies, the economic and commercial agencies, uh, as well as throughout our diplomacy. Now, because the Trump administration withdrew from the Paris Agreement, uh, this climate change component has just not really been a subject of cooperation. I think you would see a return to that because Vice President Biden has clearly committed that he would rejoin the Paris commitment and then he would go further by seeking countries to up their commitments under Paris. So I think you would see uh, a much bigger piece of this area of cooperation in a Biden-Harris administration. And frankly, in the intervening years, we've also seen how climate change has become a much more obvious existential issue for both India and the United States, given floods, droughts, extreme weather events, hurricanes and massive fires in the United States, uh, cyclones in India. This will surely be back on the radar screen in a big way. Um, Frank Samilla spoke about trade. I wanted to say just a, a two, two notes on that. Uh, the US-India trade and economic relationship has 
suffered uh, over the decades from really complicated and difficult to resolve trade frictions. Uh, the Trump administration, in my view, has exacerbated these problems with a fixation on trade deficits and uh, the application of these tariffs on steel and aluminum, which was never an issue in the relationship before. Uh, I would imagine that this fixation would not occupy uh, a Biden-Harris administration because it has not preoccupied any previous U.S. administration uh, before this one. Um, but I'd like to note something else. The Biden-Harris platform has indicated a desire to reform uh, but also preserve the important high-skilled worker visa program, which is currently on hold and not processing any applications after an order from the Trump administration. So that has also been an important area of U.S.-India engagement, albeit not without its own frictions. Um, I'm, I don't have a lot of time left. I want to put one note out there uh, to suggest that I think we would also likely see um, some increased attention to the important area of digital economy, uh, in large part spurred by the changed behavior of China in the intervening years. And the fact that India is asking new questions about access to its digital economy and the way it governs uh, issues like privacy and data protection. Um, these issues have grown in salience on the international agenda over the course of the last, let's say, five to seven years. Uh, and I can only imagine that they will continue to grow on the international agenda. You're also seeing um, experts in the digital economy and cyberspace now uh, creating more proposals about uh, the need to have more of a, a multilateral approach that brings together democracies and asks them to engage each other on how to govern the cyber and digital space. Um, this is an emerging area that I think will become increasingly important because we just simply don't have global institutions in the same way that exists for other issues of the global commons. So let me stop there uh, because we don't have a lot of time. Um, look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Alyssa. Uh, before I uh, go into Q and A session with the with Ambassador Wisner, I have a question to start both for Speaker Boehner and Congressman Crowley. You know, we were expecting a, a blowout for the Democrats, and it's become a dogfight. What happened here? Speaker of the House. Well, what, what happened here is, uh, as I, as Joe's heard me say nonstop for the last two months, the polls don't decide elections, voters do. And uh, we saw this in 2016, and, uh, and I, I haven't forgotten it since. Uh, I got elected in 1990 uh, in a Republican primary, even though my name looks like Beaner, Bonner, Boner, you know, they can't say your name, they're not going to vote for you. And I'm running against a guy named Tom Kindness, for God's sakes. Kindness versus Boner. Uh, I won because I turned my people out to vote. And, uh, and so uh, uh, the polls were just dead wrong. They are just dead wrong. And uh, Trump, uh, you know, typically when you get uh, an election with this many electors, the largest probably in American history, as Joe pointed out, uh, that would tend to favor Democrats. Uh, but Trump turned out uh, more people in red areas of the country than uh, I even knew existed. And so uh, uh, there's a, uh, you could say he exacerbated the, the partisan divide in the country uh, because red became red and blue be became redder, I should say, and blue became bluer. And so uh, uh, we're going to have to find some way to measure the electorate different than the polling uh, activities that we've seen in the past. Uh, I, I would agree with what the, the speaker said in terms of his, uh, his observations, his faithful observation, uh, observations, and, uh, and he's right. Uh, you know, polls do not elect people, you know, the people do. And um, what I would say though, though, just coming back to what I, I'll just reiterate what I said earlier uh, to some degree more emphatically, the historic nature of turning out an incumbent president you know, the power of the incumbency is, is, is a big deal. And to, um, you know, I hope the word repudiation is not too strong or hurts anyone's feelings, but I do think that that's what's happened here. Um, you know, uh, uh, there is there's gonna be dramatic change in terms of what is being said or not being said in the White House. I suspect uh, Joe Biden will not, will not be keeping us up late at night or, or up early in the morning with tweets uh, that he's posting. 
Um, and I think that that is something that the American people, I think, will come to appreciate maybe a little bit more in contrast uh, under a Biden administration. So, um, you know, to a degree, they were wrong, but at the same time, in the end, um, Democrats still control the House of Representatives. Uh, re there was a narrowing in the Senate, but Republicans still control. And Democrats, I, I believe, very soon will be announced that they have won the presidency. Uh, in my book, um, Mokesh, that, that's, that's a pretty good win um, for Democrats. I think nail biting on Tuesday has been more relieved on Wednesday and more so today, here Thursday and Friday and days to come. Uh, not without challenges, but I think uh, Democrats, um, despite the inaccuracies of the polls, in essence, it, it turned out the way in which the polls had said it would, just not the way in which they predicted it. Thank you, uh, Congressman and Speaker. Let me uh, turn to Ambassador Wisner. Next four years, U.S.-India relationship, uh, if Biden becomes the president, where do you see it going? You're on mute. Ambassador Wisner, you're on mute. Frank, you're muted. It's Frank, you're muted. You're still muted. I hope hey, I'm you unmuted. Are. You are now. Good, I'm so sorry. Um, let me associate myself with literally everything that's been said by the four speakers. Um, and <clears throat> at heart, when I look at the India-American relationship, I am uh, brought to a conclusion that has been made by each of them. And that is the relationship is certain to prosper under a Biden presidency, but it is a progressive building relationship as it's been over the course of the past several presidencies. Uh, that said, um, the reason, the core reason for it is an alignment of national interest. And the rise of China is a fundamental factor in the relationship that's unlikely to change. And it will compel the both of us to uh, <clears throat> come closer together. Now, having said that, no relationship uh, prospers if it doesn't grow and if one is unable to manage the ordinary frictions that arise between two countries. So if I have <clears throat> concerns about the future, and I, um, I, I think they lie principally in the failure of our two sides to properly resource what we're doing, and the failure of our two sides to divide disagreements over matters like trade, which are inevitable from the more uh, salient political and strategic questions. Let me touch on those two. Uh, we have just seen on the, uh, in late October, a <clears throat> two by two arrangement between the United States and India that is truly historic in its dimension. But it touches on defense, on pandemics, on academic, intellectual, immigration, cyber, trade, uh, the range of issues covered by the two sides is literally breathtaking. But in that lies a real challenge uh, and the real challenge to both sides. Both of us are distracted and resource constrained. And I believe that the promise will only take place if we attend to the agenda and then resource it properly. This is not about one side obtaining a sense of uh, profit from the outcome. Um, it's about a mutuality of commitment. And that's a hard job for both the United States and India. India is not, has not got a long tradition of sharing in this way and the United States is not necessarily a very good ally in the sense that we like to have things go our way. So managing the relationship is going to be very important about the amount of time, attention, and resources. Second, and highly important, 
and I put this challenge back to all of you, but particularly uh, Frank in this sense, is to be able to make certain that we are able to do several things at the same time. We can disagree on trade issues and trade frictions are inevitably part of a growing economic relationship between two sides, but not let those affect the overall political security uh, and other aspects of the relationship. That's a challenge. Uh, there will be uh, those from the American corporate community with deep grievances that will be arguing in a different direction, but being able to divide and deal uh, with the strategic and with the economic will be a challenge to a new administration. So I'm, those would be my summary comments as I look forward to the issues that we're gonna both have to join. Thank you, Ambassador Wisner. Uh, uh, let me just uh, invite uh, Nelson Cunningham, who is a USISPF board member, President McLarty, and quite engaged with the Biden campaign. Questions or comments from you? Nelson? Uh, thank you, Mukesh. I was uh, not expecting to be called upon, but I am delighted, of course, as a founding USISPF board member to be listening to this excellent discussion. Um, speaking only for myself and not for anyone else, let me just say that um, I know that Joe Biden is someone who knows, values, prizes the U.S.-India relationship uh, and has for a long, long time. And obviously in selecting his vice presidential nominee, uh, he was very conscious of not just the trade ties, but the human ties that link the two countries. Um, so with that, uh, I really got no question because the speakers have been so fabulous in laying out the uh, laying out issues here. Uh, so let me just say thank you, Mukesh, for, and to USISPF for organizing this. And thanks to all the speakers who are just superb. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Nelson. Uh, Alyssa, uh, one of the concerns which I keep on hearing if Biden administration comes in is, is uh, basically more questions on Kashmir, human right, CA, and other areas which Trump administration never questioned. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, this is, I've heard that too. Um, and I really think, look, Vice President Biden talks a lot about the importance of democracy. He's a champion of democracy and human rights in his published platforms on his website. He talks about his desire to convene a summit for democracy as an early initiative. Um, he has also noted publicly that he's had some concerns about what may be unfolding in India uh, with uh, Kashmir and the uh, Citizenship Amendment Act and what that might mean for uh, the rights of India's largest minority. That said, he has also said over and over again how much he values the importance of the US-India relationship and that he sees it as a relationship that is crucial for uh, US security interests, for US interests going forward. Uh, so I don't doubt that he would prioritize uh, the US-India relationship. Now, uh, it, it is the case that often good friends talk with each other and raise concerns that they have. Uh, I don't see why that should be an impediment to anything. Um, I think that uh, somebody with the history of diplomacy and foreign policy that Vice President Biden has uh, would be, you know, able to talk about difficult subjects in a, a diplomatic way and ensure that he raises things that are of concern to many people, including many Americans. And again, I, let me just note that I, I say this from my own perspective and analysis of what has been said uh, publicly, um, and I encourage others to also read these same materials that are out there. Thank you, Alyssa. Uh, Kapil Sharma, Wipro, you have a question? Thanks, Mukesh. Uh, this is a honor to uh, ask questions to Alyssa, Ambassador Wisner. Uh, to Congressman Crowley, who I've worked with when I was uh, on the Hill, 
and uh, Speaker Boehner, who uh, through George Rogers, I've heard a lot of great stories uh, about him and working for you uh, during your time in the speakership. Uh, you know, I, I, one area that you guys did not talk about, I thought was the state legislatures. I thought that the that uh, with redistricting that's going to be coming down and Republicans doing well at state legislatures, I think the impact of the elections is going to be felt for at least another 10 to 12 years uh, through redistricting, which could benefit Republicans over the long haul. Uh, yeah, and you know, Alyssa, uh, to the one point that you have, and then I'll get to my question really quick uh, on visas. While we may not see those executive orders and the regulations as extreme as uh, we saw with the Trump administration, we do see a lot of restrictions, especially around pay, that could be coming down and more, uh, more closer regulations on who can qualify for an H-1B through the Biden administration. But uh, with uh, to Congressman Crowley and Speaker Boehner, the question that I have for you is that uh, we're, we're anticipating gridlock in Congress. Uh, which will give the Biden administration probably greater, freer hand when it comes to foreign policy and trade. Where do you see, though, coming out of Congress, a divided Congress, bipartisanship when it comes to trade, when it comes to cooperation with India? Uh, is it is it going to be around defense? Is it going to be the around ag? Where, where do you see where there is some commonalities between a Republican Senate and a Democratic House when it comes to trade? Well, I think the, the trade issue has been dumped on in both 2016 presidential election and certainly in the 2020 presidential election on both sides of the political aisle. And so uh, I don't see the Congress, frankly, taking much of a role, uh, certainly not a bipartisan role when it comes to the issue of trade. Now, having said that, I would underscore Ambassador Wisner's point uh, that, uh, that the United States and India understand we need each other and we want to be each other's friends. And while there may be some differences on the trade issue that come up that we can discuss, it should not get in the way of the overall relationship and the geopolitical importance of the overall relationship. And so we can continue to work on uh, defense issues, intelligence issues, uh, health issues, a whole range of issues uh, while, while we continue to squabble uh, over a few of the trade issues. Uh, but back to uh, one of the earlier points you made, uh, there was a big effort on the part of Democrats led by Eric Holder and President Obama uh, to uh, focus on state legislative uh, races in order to flip some legislative bodies to increase uh, the chances of, uh, of Democrats doing better under redistricting. Uh, last, uh, during the election, it appears that not one state legislative body changed hands, which is really pretty remarkable because in any election, there's usually about 10 legislative bodies that typically will flip from one side to the other. And the fact that there were no changes uh, in this election is, uh, is really rather shocking, considering the huge amounts of money that were spent uh, by, my, by my friends on the other side of the aisle. Joe. Yeah, no, um, uh, it's a great question. I, I do think in terms of trade itself, I think what you saw come out of, uh, a, a good thing that came out of recently was the USMCA, uh, the agreement, uh, the, the renegotiation of NAFTA, uh, in terms of setting a, a watermark, maybe in terms of uh, Democrat, Democratic uh, co contribution uh, and uh, bipartisanship in terms of uh, uh, maneuvering that through the House and through the Senate. Uh, but I think uh, I think the speaker is right um, that I think we'll hear a lot more discussion. We'll continue to discuss and talk, and I think you'll see advancements in terms of military um, uh, cooperation, uh, as uh, Elisa uh, uh, alluded to earlier. Uh, I think that will continue. I do think what we're going to see from Biden is a reengagement on the world stage of the United States. Um, uh, first and foremost, I think the Paris Accord, despite the uh, recent steps by the administration, I think. Um, a Biden administration will move to re-engage on, on Paris. I think that they will move to re-engage in Iran, which I know is of a particular interest uh, to, um, to India and its longstanding relationship, um, um, the Persia and, the, and, and, and trade. And so I do think that that will continue. I do think the emphasis on human rights will be something that matters, not just to a Biden administration, but to a Democratic caucus, but I also think some of my Republican colleagues would also weigh in there as well. 
Uh, you know, when we talk about these trade deals, we've seen the advancements that were made in terms of labor rights and environmental uh, rights and justice within the USMCA. I think that would be applied to other countries, including India down the road. And uh, again, the issues of, of human rights would also be high on that agenda. Uh, and, and touching on some of the issues that Elisa uh, mentioned earlier as well, uh, that won't go away. In terms of the the prior, the previous, or the last part, the latter part of uh, the speaker's comments, I, I do think um, that he's correct in that uh, reapportionment is controlled by the states, and uh, the Democrats were not as successful as they had hoped to be in terms of moving some of them. But even before getting to that, or adding to that exacerbation, the party of the, of the incumbent president in the first midterm elections, which will be in 2022, historically has suffered losses in the House of Representatives. So unless Democrats find a way, as I mentioned earlier, to really push back in an effective way on the issue of defunding police and law and order, and at the same time, holding true to their values of social justice, uh, and being able to push back on the socialist tag, uh, the Democrats are gonna have even more difficult time in those more competitive districts that under a 2020 um, census or after a 2020 census, uh, the numbers, et cetera, but also the legislatures in terms of any of the gerrymandering that may take place, play, take place may make that road even more difficult. So yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a rocky road ahead, I think for everyone uh, and, and uh, you know, the one thing about presidential elections, they're not controlled by gerrymandering nor are Senate races. So I'll be interested to see what happens down the road. Thank you, Congressman. Alyssa, you had a comment there? No, just to say that I agreed. Okay, okay, all right. Uh, Lisa Schroeder from Dow, you had a question. Lisa? Yes, Mukesh, thank you. And, and the, thanks to this great panel because uh, clearly there's a lot of work that needs to be done for 2021. And I'm, I'm curious, I wanna go back a bit to the trade and the economic agenda, but particularly given, uh, especially with our Congress and on either administration, there's a lot of focus on domestic production and bringing back more of uh, supply chains into the United States, particularly in COVID related areas. That matches a lot of what we're seeing on the India side in terms of make it in India, drive for much more domestic investment, which when you put both of those next to each other kind of speak against the ability to kind of get at and particularly for US exporters, get at a lot of the um, really problematic non-tariff barriers we're seeing India put forward as part of their drive to secure more investment. I'm curious your perspective, uh, both on the congressional side, uh, Congressman Crowley, Speaker Boehner, and well, uh, Alyssa, from your perspective too, on the India side, how do we get past this drive to, you know, make it here and really create more of a, a more, clarity in the two-way mutually beneficial trade space? Well, the make it here argument is uh, one of the greatest political arguments uh, of all time. It's been going on for 250 years, and guess what? It's still going to go on. But let's separate rhetoric from reality. Uh, Congress, uh, Congress uh, will find it impossible to try to legislate in this area. And so uh, while there will be a lot of noise, no action from the Congress, period. Joe. You know, it's, it's a great question. I think as John, as the speaker has mentioned, um, a lot of emphasis from both sides of the aisle about the need to bring back manufacturing to the United States. The one thing that has really exacerbated that though beyond the politics of jobs uh, is the coronavirus itself and the lack of PPEs that we experienced, some of the parts of the world did as well. But the emphasis on, on uh, onshoring or nearshoring uh, some of that, I, I think a lot of that will be addressed, addressed through stockpiling, quite frankly. I think once uh, we get to the point where we feel as though we have enough of those resources, but that certainly has not diminished um, the discussion about onshoring or nearshoring uh, of products. Um, you know, for instance, my, my personal view when it comes to the issue of, 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 of pharmaceuticals, for instance, there's this demand as well. But there was a complicated uh, and uh, supply chain, a redundant supply chain that is global that I think we as Democrats need to recognize as well. 
and should not want to be tinkering too much with that because of the effect that it will have not only on the United States and the pricing of, of drugs, but also on the world as well. So uh, especially for the United States, uh, maintaining our cutting, uh, our, our, our cutting edge uh, in, in terms of, of developing uh, many of those products, those drugs, those life-saving drugs, life-altering drugs uh, here in the States, uh, but making them available as best we can and as cheaply as we can around the world uh, is critical as well. So we, we have to be careful moving ahead, particularly on that end. Uh, I do think that there'll be some emphasis to try to, as, as, as Biden has indicated, uh, in, encouraging through the code. Uh, and there may not be much uh, a fight on that in terms of rewarding those who stay and maybe penalizing those who invest to some degree overseas, depending on what those products may be. Thank you, uh, Congressman. Thanks, uh, Question uh, for Speaker Boehner from Derek Grinner. Uh, to what extent does the fact that former Vice President Biden is likely to only serve one term have on the prospect for finding a common ground with Leader McConnell? Or do you think that puts Biden administration in lame duck mode right off the bat? Speaker Boehner? No, I think, uh, uh, I think uh, Vice President Biden uh, is like, He's a guy who likes to get things done. Uh, I think uh, I think people will be surprised uh, that uh, that he and McConnell will be able to move a few things. Uh, what those few things are, I don't know, but uh, I would think high on the list would be an infrastructure bill. And uh, and I do think that uh, that McConnell can bring his troops along. Uh, McConnell's troops really trust him, especially after this last election. He was already in a strong position. He's in a very strong position today. And uh, uh, I think that uh, he'll want to show some record of accomplishment. I can just say this as a fact, uh, that uh, McConnell and Biden will get along far better uh, than, than Biden or than uh, McConnell and Trump ever did. I would, I, would also just, I would just add to that, I think, uh, McConnell and Biden will get along a lot better than Trump and Pelosi ever did. <laughs> uh, question for everybody. Uh, the big elephant in the room is China. And as China gets aggressive, especially in Asia Pacific, uh, we are seeing Indo-Pacific strategy, the Quad taking place. In fact, right at the moment, uh, joint exercise, exercise are taking place. The question I have for you is, you know, uh, India has to live with China, 3,000 plus long border with China. And uh, the depending on US creates a certain opportunity, but also some kind of vulnerability for India. So the question to all of you, and I'll start with Frank uh, Wisner, is, is uh, what do you recommend India to do as it manages its relations with China and builds his relationship with the U.S. Ambassador Wisner. You're on mute. Am I unmuted? Oh yeah, you are. Oh, uh, good. Uh, <clears throat> that's a, a, an extremely important question and it challenges uh, India's sense of its orientation. My own view is that India is in a period of some transition between total strategic autonomy and trying to figure out how to balance its relations in order to contain or send a message of containment to China. And that uh, is not entirely a settled matter in India. Um, my assumption is, however, that India will move into greater uh, cooperation with Australia, Japan, the United States uh, <clears throat> in this quad arrangement and will seek to expand the quad to include major Southeast Asian nations to create an even greater common front. On the other side, However, I think it's very important that India look at her obligations as a participant, not in an alliance with mutual obligations, but in an association of aligned interests to making sure she carries her side of the bargain. 
And here, uh, defense acquisitions, um, coordinated diplomacy are all going to be very important. And it's going to mean some constraints on India's capacity to operate. It's a challenge. Indian statecraft is certainly up to it, but it is a time of transition. Thank you, uh, Alisa. Um, I, I agree with everything Ambassador Wisner just said. I'd also uh, like to add that I, I you know, getting um, uh, more deeply into what Ambassador noted about India's moment of transition on this question, I think you saw over the course of the last 15 years, uh, a strong effort on New Delhi's part to try to manage its security tensions with China. These are longstanding security tensions. Um, India tried to manage these security tensions by developing ties in other arenas. So it uh, used economic engagement uh, as, as a means of having a, a channel with China, even though uh, it wasn't necessarily the greatest um, deal for India in terms of balance of trade and composition of trade. It's a complaint we've heard for many years from the Indian side. India also has cooperated very substantially with China over the years in the multilateral space, in creating uh, different kinds of multilateral institutions that leaders in New Delhi felt better represented Indian interests or, let's say, gave India a voice that it saw as more appropriate for where it was on the world stage. So, you know, the creation of the BRICS or engagement with the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, uh, the way the BRICS has developed its own new development bank, I mean, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, you could kind of go down a long list of organizations that the United States is not involved with, but that have been very important to India's diplomacy. Um, I think India will continue its engagement in the multilateral space, uh, but I think it's raising new questions about how it sees its relationship with China. You've seen as a result of the border tensions this year that Indian leaders have said this can't be business as usual. And so they have really used access to the Indian market as a way of expressing further displeasure to China. Um, and I think we're likely to see a continuation of that pattern. It's one of the reasons actually, I think that this issue of uh, the digital economy and larger digital economy governance concerns is likely to grow because India itself is staking out its own position on that question, such as with the app bans this summer. Thank you, Alistair. Uh, Frank Samolis, uh, trade has been the irritant in a bigger relationship. Do you expect Biden to be a little more uh, concentrated and try to find a solution to the trade issues between the two countries? Yeah, I think so, Mukesh. As I mentioned uh, at the outset, I think the Biden approach will be very similar to what Obama did on trade. I suspect with China, he'll come up with a more structured approach. It may be something along the lines of the old strategic and economic dialogue. But with India, there's certainly no question that he will continue with engagement on India on a broad range of trade issues. You know, it wasn't that long ago, getting back to the WTO, where India and the United States were really polar opposites on trade negotiations. And that's really one of the reasons why the Doha round collapsed in 2000. There was an unbridgeable gap between India and the United States. I think we're in a far better position in terms of the bilateral relationship. And I would like to think that there will be more cooperation on a trade front. If that's in fact the case, then I feel good about a Biden administration making progress on discrete trade issues of interest to India because there is room for improvement in the relationship. Uh, I understand the uh, broader arguments about India's own individual interests that may not always align with the United States. Alyssa's comments are a case in point as well as Ambassador Wisner's. But on the, on the trade issue and bilateral disputes, I think the broadened relationship between India and the U.S. on a multilateral forum, particularly the WTO, to me augurs well for a better bilateral relationship in resolving individual disputes. Thank you. Uh, Ryan Ong, you had a question? Ryan? 
I do. Thank you so much, Mukesh, and really appreciate this speaking lineup. This is a really fantastic program. I had a question to pick up on something that Congressman Crowley had, had raised at the beginning of the call, and this may be for him and for Speaker Boehner as well. You talked a bit about the numbers game in terms of uh, between sort of thinking about moderate Democrats versus progressive Democrats and sort of what that means for the leadership in the House. But I'm curious for your perspective on the narrative of what may potentially take hold on the Democratic side of the aisle, given sort of what we've seen from the House. Do you see the narrative as being, you know, focused more on lack of support for sort of positive message for Democrats in, in swingy districts or purple districts? Do you see the progressives making a broader push that the concern was not having a strong enough message going far enough on the side of the line? And sort of what are the implications then for policy working with Democrats in Congress heading forward, as well as some of the leadership conversations that we may see in the next couple of months. Is that for me, uh, Ryan? Yeah. Yes, you go okay. first, Joe. All right, John. Thanks, Speaker. Um, look, I, I think that both parties have been on, under duress and stress in terms of dealing with, uh, for lack of a better term, extremes within their parties from the right in terms of the uh, the Tea Party movement or the justice, or, or I'm sorry, John, I think what they call them. The, the Freedom Caucus. Freedom Caucus. The knuckleheads. The knuckleheads. <laughs> the knuckleheads. <laughs> and, uh, and, um, and from our side, um, you know, the more left-wing uh, socialist Democrats um, or democratic socialists um, that have uh, uh, really uh, through the, uh, the Bernie Sanders wing of the party, so to speak, Look, I think there's going to be a, a tremendous discussion that will go on uh, in the Democratic caucus. And I think even the Republican caucus, although I think Kevin McCarthy's uh, support uh, will have been uh, bolstered by uh, the unexpected uh, wins that they've had and the protection of some of their incumbents. Uh, and vice versa for Democrats, although Democrats uh, continue to hold on to uh, power in the House of Representatives, uh, the nuanced way in which it's going to happen is, is certainly has, has ruffled many feathers. So I think um, there's going to be a robust discussion. You're going to hear from people who lost um, their seats uh, because, as I mentioned earlier, uh, they had hold the fund, the police movement, and uh, the classification or the tag of being socialists. Um, you know, look at um, uh, Donna Shalala in Florida. You know, uh, Donna Shalala is maybe a lot of things. She's not a socialist, you know, and um, but I think uh, the Trump, I think the Trump team uh, used the issue effectively in a district that has a large Cuban, Colombian, Ecuadorian, and as well as Venezuelan population. And talking about Maduro and Castro, you know, folks who came from those those countries experienced totalitarianism quite often from the left. And we're not prepared to see that move again. That tag of socialism got tagged even to Joe, to Joe Biden. And uh, John has heard me say this before. Uh, I don't know how many folks who are listening remember the TV show Happy Days, uh, but the character Chachi, uh, Scott Bayo called uh, Joe Biden a socialist. And I responded by saying, Joe Biden is much a socialist as Scott Bayo is an actor. Quite frankly, it just is preposterous, you know. Um, but uh, it did stick in many places. And even where Democrats won re-election, and, and Speaker Boehner knows this, you look at uh, Matt Cartwright in Pennsylvania, or Susan Wild, or uh, 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 Chrissy Houlihan, um, or Connor Lamb, for instance, outside the, the, the Pittsburgh area. Um, they got stung pretty hard uh, fending off those attacks. And they're going to have an awful lot to say in terms of the makeup of that leadership, I think, well, the last thing I'll say is Pelosi does know this. Uh, and as, as Speaker Bannon knows, in her district back in San Francisco, they call her a conservative Catholic, you know? So it's all relative as to where you come from. Uh, 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 neither John or I believe that, quite frankly. But having said that, she does know this. Um, to, 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 to take control of the House of Representatives, you can replace all the Joe Crowley's you want with the AOC's you want. It doesn't make a difference in terms of the number. What matters is winning in those marginal districts, Democrats taking seats for Republicans and vice versa. That's where the power of control of the House of Representatives comes from. And there's no lonelier place in Washington than being in the minority in the House of Representatives. And that it's, a, it's, a, it's an all or nothing kind of uh, a battle. And, and that's what Pelosi knows. And 
that's why I think uh, she knows the road to maintaining that is through the middle. And I think she's going to steer that way. Thank John, you. I don't want to comment. Well, listen, uh, let's reset the stage here for a moment. Uh, I went through this after the 2010 election, 2012, 2014 election, uh, when uh, the Tea Party, the Freedom Caucus, or as I call them, the knuckleheads, uh, began to gain more power. And trying to manage uh, the far right from what I'll call uh, regular Republicans. I'm a conservative Republican, but I'm not nuts. And uh, uh, some of these guys are just nuts. Well, beginning in the 2018, 2020 election, uh, Pelosi uh, has brought, uh, uh, the Democrat party has brought these uh, progressives, socialists, you can call them whatever you want, uh, but uh, they're as crazy as the people on the far right. I mean, the Green New Deal is not gonna happen, all right? And uh, <laughs> Pelosi could want it, far left Democrats could want it, but it's gonna kill uh, those competitive districts that decide who the majority is in the House of Representatives. With the redistricting coming, uh, Republicans will aim to take out uh, some of those uh, moderate Democrats in seats where we think we can win. And, uh, and Pelosi is gonna have her hands full uh, here over the next two years, as will Joe Biden. You're gonna see this play out between now and the inauguration, uh, because the far left is not gonna get what they want. Bernie Sanders isn't gonna be the Secretary of Labor. Elizabeth Warren isn't gonna be the Secretary of Treasury. And uh, the progressives are gonna want uh, uh, Biden uh, to, uh, to cater to them. And I don't think Joe's gonna quite do it. So it's, uh, you'll see it play out here over the coming months. It's gonna, gonna be kind of interesting to watch. I agree with John. I, I, hate, to say, I hate to say it, but I'll, I'll probably sit here in glee watching it. <laughs> Thank you, Speaker Vader. I'm conscious that part, of I, that part I don't agree with. <laughs> I'm conscious of the time, and we've passed our time. So, one final question to all of you, and then we wrap it up. And that is uh, more from Paresh Patel. That is, what is one key deliverable you see the Biden administration can pursue in order to enhance the US India relationship? So let me start with Ambassador Wisdom. Uh, Mukesh, I'm going to flip that question on you uh, because I deeply believe if we look at this as deliverables the United States owes to India, we're gonna fall short of the promise of the relationship. Uh, this has got to be seen as a joint enterprise. It has to be seen as India's ability to do things that bring itself into greater alignment and the United States doing things that sustain the engagement that we've outlined. If it's looked at as some sort of cargo cult, we're not going to make the relationship move. And if I could think of one area where uh, we in India really ought to put our heads together, in addition, obviously, to the China question, is, is, is in the field of trade. For I believe here, you cannot possibly make an India and raise tariff barriers at the same time and expect to have a reciprocal response from the outside. So an area of real reflection for my Indian friends. Thank you, Alyssa. Uh, just to build on some of my comments earlier, I think the, the climate and clean energy space is an area of huge promise, um, all the more urgent given what we've seen in the last five, seven years with the you know, changing weather patterns that threaten people. Um, so I think that, that India has become a global leader on solar clean energy transition. Um, I think finding a way to develop uh, either uh, some sort of major um, a bilateral initiative or a series of, of uh, smaller initiatives that are all in this same space would be a real win for both sides. Thank you, uh, Frank Samolas. 
Rakesh, I would say, again, look back to the WTO. This would be win-win for both countries. A, a joint effort, a statement by India and the United States that they now intend to get serious about reforming the multilateral trade institution and perhaps even initiating trade talks. Uh, it's not a concession by either party. It's a sign of good faith, and it's a sign of both countries embracing multilateralism. Thank you. Uh, Congressman Joe. I think as Frank uh, Simolis, uh, sorry, Frank Simolis, as well as uh, Ambassador Wisden said, I think it's a two-way street. But I do think that the quest for uh, China for blue uh, water Navy is something that has um, all of us uh, concerned. Uh, so I do think that the expansion of military ties between the two countries will be critical. Uh, exercises, joint exercises and cooperation is going to be important. Um, but I do think when it comes to trade, it's, you know, it's not always about what the United States will do for India. It's a two-way street is, uh, is, is what I think Frank uh, Wisner is saying, Ambassador Wisner is saying. Thank you, Congressman. Speaker Boehner. I think uh, the number one issue you're going to see is a change of attitude or a change of style. Uh, I'll call it a kinder, gentler approach uh, to our dealings, not only with uh, India, but with other countries around the world. Uh, where you've got a, a kinder, gentler attitude, uh, it fosters more conversation uh, and more progress. And so uh, uh, I, that'd be, the, I think, the most important thing uh, that could happen uh, to re-kick this relationship into another year. Thank you. I just want to say thank you to uh, Ambassador Business Speaker Boehner, Congressman Crowley, uh, Frank Samolis, Alyssa Ayer, for taking the time. Interesting discussion. I think we have a lot of work to do, but thank you once again on behalf of USSPF and Squire Patent Box. Have a good day.